Hello everybody and welcome to the RTA's webinar on the deep dive into Queensland's new housing legislation amendments. My name is Lynn Smith. I'm the, with the communication and education team at the RTA. I've been here for over 16 years in two areas of education and also a dispute resolution area. So overall, I have over 35 years experience dealing with all things tenancy laws and also landlords, agents and tenants. We also have Lauren from our outreach team helping us with um, any technical issues or support in the background and also behind the scenes with our polls and questions. So thanks for joining in today as well, Lauren. Before I do start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are holding today's webinar and where you are joining us from as well and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We do have a lot to cover in today. So today's presentation, I want to just quickly go over the overview and also the DFB um, protections that was introduced in October. I want to focus on what we know so far, um, what's to start and what has started, what is to start and provide you with an update from the RTA. Please note, we do not have a proclamation date as yet for some of the key legislation changes. However, the content we provide you today will give you a better understanding of what is around the corner. When the dates are announced, there will be a lot to take in and you'll be ready um, ahead of everybody and better informed. So we know that we cannot provide you with legal advice and as always, you are encouraged to seek your own independent advice and make informed decisions. So our webinar is interactive and we want to hear from you. I'll also be doing a few polls during the session um, we will have a question session before the webinar ends and we'd love to receive your questions. So please use the chat function. That's the speech bubble in your Zoom toolbar and what you see on your, the image that you see on your screen. Um, I'd also like to advise that we do have quite a large number of attendees in our audience today and note that the question time may go over our allocated time um, or that we may not get to all questions, but we will certainly try. We also want to hear from you on how today went and importantly, what future topics you would like to know more about. So please look out for the survey at the end of the webinar. It'll only take about a minute to complete. So Lauren, I think we'll launch our first poll. Um, this is just to find out which area of Queensland you are joining us today from and which rental group do you identify with. Um, keep in mind, uh, keep in note too that the webinar that we did last November when the new rules first was introduced um, did a focus on domestic and family violence um, but rest assured we will continue to do more education as more information does come to hand. Okay Lauren you've got poll going there for me thank you. Um, so what we are seeing is that um, we do have the bulk of our audience today our property managers or agents and also landlords and followed by community housing and support workers. So, Lauren, I might just get you to share that poll. Right. And also to the second part in relation to um, where you are joining us today from. And we have 77% joining us from South East Queensland, but a big shout out to our central, north and west Queensland people as well. Thanks, Lauren. So let's kick on with our first topic, and it was just to summarise briefly the process of the new amendments. So this commenced with renting reform consultation back in 2018, and the image on your right-hand side of your screen shows the various steps up until where we are now, with, which is the Housing Legislation Amendments Act 2021. Um, and that was passed in Parliament in October and became law. This amends the existing Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act and regulations and also repeals the COVID emergency response laws. Four key areas, domestic and family violence, framework for negotiating renting with pets, um, approved reasons to end a tenancy and minimum housing standards. So more information on the process or a copy of the amendments can be found on the links on your screen and I'll also get Lauren to send that um, copy of the links into the chat function as well so that you can um, copy them over into your um, notes if you want to look for more information. This is only stage one. There will be a stage two rental law reform. And also too, if you want more information on the housing legislation amendment bill, um, there is also explanatory notes so that you can actually also search for them. 
So the previous webinar on the changes in November last year, we went into more detail on the DfE provisions. However, let's make sure that we're all on the same page and I'm just gonna quickly summarise the DfE provisions over the next few slides. It does apply to general tenancies as well as roomy accommodation. So the DfE provisions are effective as of 20 October, 2021. Tenants experiencing DfE can end their interest in the tenancy, request their bond contribution be refunded if they paid bond money. Um, they're not liable for relating costs or any damage caused by the domestic and family violence. If they decide, in the, decide to stay in that rental property, they can look to change the locks or any access codes without the owner's consent to ensure their safety. Yes, they will need to provide a copy of the keys when it's practical to do so. So the practical side of this process, noting that we have new forms that you may need to be finding yourself familiar with, and I'll step through them shortly. The tenant impacted by domestic and family violence, the vacating tenant will need to provide the property manager owner with a notice ending tenancy interest. They'll also need to provide a copy or show relevant evidence. And that's such as things like a protection order or a police notice or a completed domestic and family violence report. The DFB report can be completed by various health practitioners, support professionals, a refuge or crisis worker, um, a solicitor, or even a social worker. But what happens if you, as a property manager or owner, don't agree? Then you need to apply to QCAT within seven days to have the notice set aside, but you will also need to advise the vacating tenant that this is your option. Um, this is the process that you must follow. You can't, can I just confirm here, you can't just say, no, I'm not going to accept it and force the tenant to stay if they're wanting to follow this process. So again, if you don't agree, then it's the QCAT um, pathway. If the domestic and family violence tenant that is leaving has claimed their portion of the bond, um, you can also respond to the notice of claim and dispute the refund if you do not agree. There is a strict process to follow for remaining tenants, including issuing a continuing interest notice and that's not issued until it's between day seven to day 14 after the person experiencing the violence interest in the tenancy has ended. So you can also ask them to top up the rental bond balance. Uh, remember for managers and their employees and for the owner, there's compliance for confidentiality in this situation and must, you must not disclose the domestic and family violence information. There are penalties attached to this new section if you breach them, and it has been taken quite seriously. So can I just clarify here too, it's probably seen as best practice to document or keep a record of your process and ensure that the vacating tenant has left and your timeframes for notification to the remaining tenant complies with the required timeframe. And you have also informed the vacating tenant the date that you are issuing that notice. So again, remember that confidentiality and safety is a priority in these situations. So please be familiar with the new four forms that we have relating to domestic and family violence provisions. All of them are available on our website. Um, if there's a person claiming a bond um, that is the person that's experiencing DFB and claiming their portion, a new form 4A, just a reminder that can be submitted by paper to the RTA or by email and not by the RTA's web services. The other um, notices that you have there is the notice ending tenancy interest, the Form 20, the DFB report, and that's what I talked about before as that um, further evidence for that notice, and also the continuing interest notice. Um, also to keep in mind the RTA, um, we are in the process of releasing a new domestic and family violence flowchart um, available for managers and owners, one for tenants, um, also for providers and residents as well. And it will cover both the rooming and the general tenancies. It's going to help you navigate this process. So do watch out for that. That should be released on our website shortly. So I just want to clarify some of the processes. So um, firstly, um, about the remaining tenants being issued a notice of claim. So in a domestic and family violence situation, any bond co-contributors are not issued a notice of claim. Hence, there is a new form four that we um, are asking you to use that we can identify that situation and only the property manager owner is issued the notice of claim. 
One of the questions we have been receiving is, can the vacating tenant be held liable for other breaches? And I know that um, there's some, also some comments coming through and some questions about that. So yes, they can be. So if there is rent or water bill, then yes, they can actually be held liable for that. It's very clear they're not liable for damages caused by the domestic and family violence. A tenant leaving in a DFE situation cannot be charged a break lease reletting fee and costs. Um, if the situation is a marriage breakdown, um, one party is leaving, depending on the situation, you can have like a mutual agreement to end that tenancy or the tenant could apply to QCAT on the grounds of hardship to end the tenancy. So if it's not a domestic and family violence situation with the supporting evidence, then they don't follow that DFE process. Um, can a property manager refuse the domestic and family violence notice? I did mention it before, and there is a process that you do need to follow if you don't accept the notice. Or, and that is, you can't just say, no, I don't accept it. If you disagree, you as an agent or landlord need to apply to that QCAT and follow that process. You need to inform the vacating tenant that that's the pathway that you're taking. Um, with regards to QCAT and a bond process, you can have two processes um, running at the same time. So if you've applied to QCAT to have the notice set aside, you can also dispute the bond refund if there was a claim and they're two separate processes. A notice is an urgent um, application directly to QCAT, whereas the bond dispute, it's through the RTS free dispute resolution process first and is a non-urgent matter. Um, and keep in mind, if the RTA does receive an order from QCAT saying that the interest in the tenancy is not to con is to continue and it's not eligible for the claim on the bond, then we will act accordingly on that order. Um, what happens if the DFE situation is not with the co-tenant and with someone else who lives, who lives somewhere else? So the DFE tenant may still uh, be in a situation requiring them to leave the property. They can still follow the process to end their tenancy interest. Again, would need to provide that supporting documentation to you. Remember, as a property manager or an owner, you are assessing the information provided um, to see if it meets the requirements as set out under the Act. You're not judging whether the DFE has occurred or not. If there is an evidence gap in the documentation, you may be looking for more information as what is outlined under the Act, nothing more. So I just want to be clear, agents and landlords, you know, you don't have a right in relation to the judging of the DFE, whether it's occurred or not. It's assessing the information provided to make sure it meets the requirements as what is set out in the Act. There are organisations that can provide assistance to anyone fleeing DFE, and you can find more of that information on our website as well. Okay. What I might do is just go to our next session, which is about the minimum housing standards. And um, we might come back to some of the um, questions asked on DFE after this session. So section 185 is for the lessor's general obligations. That continues. The owner must ensure the premises are clean, fit to live in, not in breach of any health or safety laws. And while the tenancy continues, they've got to carry out repairs and maintenance. So if you have a landlord client not willing to carry out repairs, then this is a section that you must be quoting them. For roomy accommodation, it's section 247 outlining the provider's general obligations. So the minimum housing standards are not currently in effect. So time has been given for property owners to be compliant. So they do, they're due to come, um, due to commence, sorry, from 1 September 2023 for all new tenancies. So when you have a new tenancy signed or a renewal, and then for all other tenancies, for everybody else, it'll be 1 September 2024. So what it means is that there is time to ensure property owners are up to speed with the requirements. So the minimum housing standards was first passed back in 2017 as part of the government previous election commitment. So this allowed for the introduction of the standards as part of the housing legislation amendment 2021 with more details and what you see on your screen. So the rental um, property needs to fall into two categories of safety and security. And the other one is the reasonable functionality. So some items listed look to be fairly standard, such as a functioning um, kitchen and a laundry, adequate plumbing and drainage and weatherproof and structurally sound. But it's also put a clarification around locks on windows and doors to help secure the property. Now, the section says 
a functioning lock or latch fitted to all external windows or doors to secure the premises against unauthorised entry. The property needs to be free of vermin, damp and mould and also the requirement of privacy coverings. So this is meaning your blinds and your curtains installed in rooms which tenants are reasonably likely to expect privacy. However, keep in mind it also states that it does not apply to a window if it's in line of a site from outside inside if it's obstructed by a fence, a hedge or a tree. So again, I might just stop there before we keep going, Lauren, and just come back to um, some of the questions that we've got coming in because a lot of them are in relation to the uh, domestic and family violence part. So um, are they responsible for cleaning the home um, when they're leaving? So I suppose at the end of the day, when the tenant is leaving the property, again, they're responsible for any, if there's any other breaches. However, there still is a section of the legislation that talks about if um, that the tenant returns the property in the same condition it was at the start of tenancy, less fair wear and tear. So just always keep that in mind. That actually might actually also um, fills in a few other gaps for some other of the questions that's coming through as well. Um, just wanting to confirm the continuing tenant cannot be told until seven days after the vacating tenant has left. Correct. So we're looking at once the time frame is up, so the vacating tenant needs to give seven days notice of their intention to leave. They can leave earlier, that's fine, but you would also want to clarify that they have left. So their notice is at the end of that time. So between days seven and 14, after that expiry of day seven, you would actually be issuing the um, continuing interest notice to the remaining tenants. In relation to the evidence, um, I think I've actually sort of clarified that in the um, um, previous slides, but we're talking about there is a domestic and family violence report that is available on the RTA's website, and it can be completed by various pract um, practitioners and support workers and things like that. So again, that sort of information is available also if they happen to have like a police report or another um, type of evidence that supports the situation. Um, it does say they can either provide you with a copy or show you. So some people may have a, a particular notice. They don't actually give you an actual copy, but they will actually show you what that copy is. Um, also, too, in relation to a share house situation, um, if the remaining tenants are responsible, again, it comes back to um, yeah, the cleaning or the, any damages, the tenant that is actually at the end of their tenancy to return the property in the same condition it was, less spare wear and tear. Um, I might just keep going on to the next slot, um, Lauren, and um, we'll come back to the next lot of um, questions. Okay, so let's have a look at, there's a lot of other amendments that's in amongst the new amendments and they have yet to have a start date. So I just want to quickly go through all of these. Um, it's not an exhausted list, but things that I felt that were really quite important for you to be aware of. So changes to the entry condition report timeframe. Currently, tenants have three days to return a signed and completed copy of the entry condition report to you as a property manager or an owner. This allows them the opportunity to note down any damages or if items are not clean or working. The new amendments will see the time frame change to seven days, giving tenants more time to return that report. So when it does come in, um, property managers, you'll need to look at your business practices, whether you send out reminders to have the tenants return the report or not. So we are also aware that some managers still do the report together with the incoming tenant, and that's fine. So this will also be applicable for roomy accommodation. And what's also been clarified here is unless a new condition report is prepared for a renewal agreement, the entry condition report for the original agreement is taken to be the report for that tenancy. So for that one, it's business as usual for most of that, um, for that particular section. Um, let's focus now a bit on the repair changes for general tenancy. So an increase from two weeks to four weeks for cost of emergency repairs. Additional sections have been added in, um, section 221A to 221C, regarding repair orders with the tribunal, including an extension of time request to comply with a repair order and also an offence to contravene a repair order. So there's penalty units that's attached to this section 
50 penalty units and also a weekly offence if it continues of five penalty units for each week that the offence does continue. Um, new section is 219A. The lessor's agent may arrange for emergency repairs to be made meaning that the managers will be able to authorise emergency repairs on behalf of an owner client up to the equivalent of four weeks rent and make deductions from rent payments up to the cost of the repair before disbursement of funds. Now, we know in most practices that your management agreements for property managers may have up to two weeks rent for emergency repairs. When this does come into play, the amendments will allow up to four weeks. So keep in mind, um, if you are a property manager, whether you need to make any amendments um, with your agreement or agreements um, directly with your landlord clients. Um, that's not covered um, between the RTA, that's more like an office fair trading form. And again, these have yet to have a start date. Um, other additional changes coming in, there's a new clause 357A, where you can write a special term in the tenancy agreement, requiring the tenant to pay reasonable costs, uh, reasonable reletting costs. Um, if the agreement is a fixed term and the tenant ends the agreement other than a way that's permitted under the Act. Um, the tenant's liable under the term um, for the reasonable costs incurred by the landlord in reletting the premises. So that's your lease break situation. Um, this does not apply for tenants experiencing domestic and family violence where the tenant ends the agreement or interest in the agreement. Uh, there is also a new clause, section 57A, offer of a residential tenancy must disclose particular information. What this information is, has yet to be prescribed in a regulation. So once we know more, we can also inform you of this. Clause 58 um, is amended to require not just a document prepared for section 60 in 61, which is the lease agreement, but also states any other information prescribed by a regulation. So again, once that regulation has been finalised, will be able to let you know more information. Um, the providing of particular information will also apply to rooming accommodation. Um, so for people doing rooming, section 76 A and B. So to give you an example, currently we have it that there's a, a, a copy of the proposed tenancy agreement. Um, what we are looking at, there will be other information as well. Just also too, for a side issue for rooming accommodation providers and residents, new section 105 A, allows residents to apply to the tribunal if they believe rent increase is excessive. For general tenancies, that's already in place, but for rooming, that has actually been added. So some of the bond amendments um, include clarification around if a resident is a board or a lodger and that the, if a bond's paid, that needs to be lodged with the RTA. Section 136 has the sections been expanded and now include a separate A to E. While most of this is the same as previously, please note if seeking an extension of time to apply to, to the tribunal, um, that has also um, been clarified about sufficient reasons and have also provided um, examples. The extension period uh, is up to three days. So with this one, this is in relation to the um, notice of claim that's come through, then the other party disputes it. It goes through our dispute resolution. And so what we're talking about here is that if it's unresolved, a notice of unresolved dispute is issued. Um, and what we mean that if someone is unable to apply to the tribunal in that time frame, which as we know with bonds, it's seven day time frame. Um, if there's a sufficient reason, such as the person was hospitalized during the claim period, or there's been an impact by a natural disaster, they're the reasons it's also been put in there. Um, then they can seek an extension for up to three days. Um, and the last point is the um, RTA not to pay a bond if the authority knows the tenant did not vacate the property. So let's talk about pets, shall we? Um, at the time of this webinar, the current laws still apply, meaning that the owner or manager must give permission. Tenants and owners will need to comply with the body corporate bylaws what we do know, and it's common practice for tenants to provide managers and owners with a pet resume, details of the pet, photo, part of their application. So the tenancy agreement will also state yes or no if a pet's approved. And also best idea is to state the type of pet. Don't just say one dog, but be a bit of a description about the dog. Say, you know, it's one medium sized dog or better still, it's one male spaniel called Max. 
you know, as you can see in the slide, dogs do come in different shapes and sizes. So it's always best to be descriptive in case the dog passes and a new dog's bought um, that may not necessarily be the same size or type. So with renting with a pet and the new laws that again have yet to have a start date, um, it will apply for general tenancies and rooming accommodation. Remember, this is about a negotiation framework. A tenant can seek permission and the manager can only refuse a request on identified reasonable grounds and will need to do so within 14 days. We will have more information once we have a start date. So the next slide I'm going to talk about is about the reasonable grounds for refusal. Um, a manager's consent may be subject to reasonable conditions and that's fine, such as the dog or cat needs to stay outside, um, but you need to be noting that it's also been very clear that any pet damage is not deemed to be fair wear and tear. And you'll also be able to have the carpet cleaning clauses and also the pest control clauses. You cannot ask for a pet bond or increase the rent to allow for a pet. So let's have a look at the reasonable grounds to refuse. These are outlined under section 184E. These include what you see on your screen. The premises are unsuitable or the pet is likely to cause damage that could not be practically re be repaired for a cost less than the rental bond amount. It could be um, contravening another law um, or bylaw um, risk to health and safety of another person. As you can see, pets do come in many shapes and sizes. We're not just talking about cats, dogs, and birds. Or if the tenant does not agree with the reasonable conditions that have been proposed by the landlord as part of the condition of having a pet. The new laws also include some clarification around a working dog um, does not require a landlord's approval. A working dog is covered under three legislations, as you see on your screen, so your guide dog, corrective service dog, or police dog. So section 171, the supply goods and services, now has that exemption regarding a special term that allows the manager or the owner to request that pest control and carpet cleaning if that pet is allowed. For rooming accommodation attendees today, um, all the PEP rules are under section 256A to G um, in the new amendments. So Lauren, I'm just gonna come back to you now in relation to another poll, because I'd like to hear your thoughts um, in relation to the new PET laws. So Lauren, if I can get you to please launch the um, poll, thank you. So what is your perspective on legislation regarding the PETs? So are you comfortable and understand where the new laws are coming from? Um, the difficulties in responding to the pet requests, potential for any damages, or if you're on the other side, getting approval from the landlord may be challenging. So what we're looking for is some information from you about what you see is um, your concerns in this field. So I'll just leave that going for a moment. Uh, just confirming. Okay, so just a couple of questions on the um, minimum housing standard side thing. Just confirming a latch rather than a lock acceptable on windows and whether it's a requirement for a key lock. Legislation hasn't actually been gone right into specifics, but I think what you need to be looking at, it does very clearly say a lock or a latch, but it's all about the safety and security of the premises. Um, so obviously when we're talking doors, absolutely key locks and things like that. Um, we also do um, asking a question, do we need security screens on windows? Um, there's nothing in the legislation that talks about that. Um, again, it's that probably that reasonable test as well, but there's nothing that says about putting on security screens. Lauren, we might just close that poll and I might just get you to launch um, what the result or share the results for me if that's okay. Um, and it looks like a um, bit of a mixed challenge there in relation to there are quite a few people, 30% um, are saying that they're comfortable with understanding the new laws. Um, but there might be some issues in relation to the approval side of it and also the potential damages. So thanks, everybody. And Lauren, you can stop sharing that for me. Thanks. Okay, let's get on to the next um, part of today's presentation, which is the ending of a tenancy. So 
With the other major changes, this is probably um, the last major um, well, main topics. The without grounds provision has been removed and new reasons to end the tenancy has been added. So these new grounds will apply for general tenancies and roomy accommodation. However, the time frame is going to differ as usual between the two types of tenancies. So the new grounds include ending of a fixed term agreement, the owner undertaking significant repair or renovations, uh, a change of use of the property, um, preparing a property to sell or the sale of the rental property. Um, and these new point, these new sections are probably more from the owner's or the manager's point of view as well. But I will get into a little bit more some of the other new grounds that's been also added from the tenant's point. Um, a new section 297B, application to terminate because of a serious breach under general tenancy. So this one is going to include illegal activities, intentional or reckless destroyed or damaged the premises or endangered another person or significantly um, interfered with the reason, peace, comfort and privacy of another tenant. With this section, it also states that the owner may form a reasonable belief that the property has been used for an illegal activity, whether or not anyone has been convicted or found guilty of an offence. So for our community um, housing providers in um, today's session, keep in mind section 290A still applies for when the lessor is a state or it's community housing. Also too, I just wanna flag before I go to the next um, slide, um, section 299 is all about repeated breaches in ending a tenancy. Um, there has been an additional section added. So it's 299 4G, and that includes repeated breaches for when a tenant breaches a body corporate bylaw or for caravan park managers, a bre um, repeated breaches of park rules. Okay, additional grounds have also been added for um, tenants. So tenants will have the ability to end a tenancy due to the property not in good repair or complying with minimum housing standards. Uh, the tenant needs to give notice in the first seven days when the tenant occupies the property. Um, if a co-tenant passes away and it would be impractical for the remaining tenant to continue or would cause them hardship, they can also end the tenancy. Um, so again, clarification on this one, that is not a lease break, they can end the tenancy. Um, if the premises are primarily used to provide student accommodation and the tenant stops being a student, as outlined in the Act, they can give notice of their intention to leave. And so this is called ending of entitlement to student accommodation. Also to the student accommodation provider can also give a notice to a resident if they are no longer a student, providing that accommodation is for the purpose of student accommodation. Also too, a tenant may um, be applying to a tribunal to terminate the tenancy due to misrepresentation by the lessor or the lessor's agent. So for this section, 312A, it must be within three months of the tenant occupying the property. Um, and also the new section 246A regarding the tenant taking action or applying to the tribunal. If the tenant reasonably believes the action by the lessor in giving a breach notice, increasing the rent or ending the tenancy or refusing to enter into another fixed agreement is due to the tenant, re, um, re, the tenant requesting repairs or um, requesting reimbursement or for emergency repairs or applying to the tribunal for an order. This also does apply for roomy accommodation under section 276A. So I just want to have a look at just a few examples. This is an exhausted list, but I want to just have a um, look at the practical side um, and share with you um, in relation to ending a tenancy. So what we're looking at, fixed term agreements can end during the fixed period if there's been a breach, not rectified, requiring that Form 12 notice to leave issued. A fixed term can also end with the new reason because it's the end of the fixed term date. And of course, you do have mutual agreement as well. Um, periodic agreements, or if it's coming to the end of the fixed term and you're giving the correct time frame, and that is not before the end of the tenancy term, you have also the significant repairs or renovations being done, owner or their immediate family moving in, sale requiring vacant possession, and also mutual agreement. 
So the Act still sets out how a tenancy can end, so nothing has changed from that regard as well. So um, they're still in place um, with also ending due to um, domestic family violence if they are also a sole tenant. So I've put this slide in here in relation to a bit of a caution. So there is penalty provisions apply um, in relation to, and it's up to 50 penalty units um, for providing false or misleading information in a notice that is requiring the tenant to leave. This is again for rooming providers and agents and property owners. So if you, um, as an owner needs to, you or an agent, you need to ensure that when you are ending a tenancy due to a sale contract um, or putting the property on the market, significant repairs, redevelopment or de demolition, there's a change of use or the owner's moving back in, that it is true and correct and not used as a way to end a tenancy. If you have ended the agreement because of this, you cannot offer a residential tenancy or a rooming agreement for the premises for six months after the handover date of the tent vacating tenant. So key sections here, um, 365 for false and misleading information and 365B and D not reletting the premises for six months after ending the tenancy. Um, so section 371A to E is for the rooming accommodation. So with the new amendments added, there will be around 140 sections of the legislation that will have penalty sections attached. So currently under the um, current residential tenancy room accommodation out of the 568, there's 120 sections. Well, there's about another 20 that's been added for the new housing legislation amendments. So before I go to the next slide, Lauren, can I just get you to pull up another poll for me, please, just in relation to the ending of the tenancy? What we'd like to do is actually hear from you. Do you have a better understanding of the ending tenancy reasons um, or you just need more time to review some timeframes um, or not sure in relation to ending a fixed or a periodic um, or other? Okay. So we've actually got, are you allowed to charge a pet application fee? The answer is no, just in relation to some of the questions that's been asked. Um, so you can't do that. So the legislation is very clear about what you can ask for and a application fee, whether it's a pet or not, um, a certain application fee is not allowed under the legislation at all. Um, another question, obviously, from a, an on-site manager who's coming in asking for managing large unit complexes, what may be reasonable amount of pets? Um, it's not so much in relation to that in our legislation. It's more in relation to, obviously, when you're in a complex um, of apartments, you're going to have what you call the bylaws. You're going to have to obviously have committee approval for pets. So that's a little bit outside the guidelines. But again, also, too, the legislation that is coming into play says that obviously the committee or the body or the body corporate committee needs to obviously provide um, permission as well. Um, in relation to just another question coming back through uh, about privacy coverings, um, they are in relation to the things such as your blinds and your curtains or some other type of screening um, that might be put through. So that's again, just make sure that there's privacy for the tenant for particular rooms. Um, how are we going with that poll there, Lauren? Um, okay, so it looks like um, majority of people do actually have a, a fair understanding of what the new reasons are or just needing a little bit more time. I'll just get you to share those results if you wouldn't mind, Lauren. Thanks. Um, and we just got a few people just for other. If there is something else that um, you feel is, is an issue or concern, please put a little comment in the um, chat function. Um, okay, so we do actually have some questions in relation to a lot of people asking about well, what happens if the property um, sells to an investor, do they have to wait six months before they can relet? The answer to that is no, because obviously it's going, it's the purpose, it, this particular clause is more about um, if you are ending the tenancy and asking the tenant to leave because the property has been um, sold or you're looking to have the property prepared to sell, what we're looking at is um, if it's been false and misleading in relation to the intent of ending that tenancy. 
So if the property has been sold to an investor, then obviously if they're happy to end the part of the contract is that the tenancy continues. Keep in mind if a tenant is on a fixed term agreement, then you can't end the tenancy on that reason if the property is being sold, uh, not before the end of that fixed term tenancy period. So if an investor has purchased, then they then obviously become the new um, owner as such. Um, in relation to body corporate, sometimes do charge for pet application. Um, again, that's not in our laws. Our laws state that um, we don't have um, an application fee that can be charged. In relation to body corporate laws, that might be something um, very different. And I would actually refer you to the Body Corporate Commissioner's Office for that particular um, answer. Just another one before I just keep going to what happens if the property doesn't sell? Um, and that's a very good point um, too. Obviously, if someone does try to look at selling the property um, and after three months they have not been able to sell it, um, I really don't can't give you legal advice on that. But again, um, obviously, it would be showing and, and providing all that evidence in relation to the, the intent was there to actually sell the property. But the legislation is very clear about not being able to relet under the six month period. Okay, I'll just keep going on to the next part of the slides and then we'll come back and do some more questions. But we do have a lot of questions coming in. So I'm so sorry if I haven't been able to get to everybody's question, but we will try. Um, and also too, it will actually give us an opportunity to make sure that we can provide more resources and more information on our website based on the themes and the topics that you're actually raising today. So most of the COVID-19 regulations that were implemented during 2020 and also amended in 21 have been removed um, and particularly for the domestic and family violence provisions, they were repealed. Um, so, but what we do have is some of the amendments are continuing up until the 30th of April, 2022. And they are as what you see on your screen the protections for tenants against being listed on the tenants database because of rent is caused by COVID-19 impacts, uh, limits on relating costs for people who are eligible um, in that regard, ending their fixed tenancies early, and also to short tenancy um, statements uh, extensions. So where to from here? And I am conscious that we are getting a little bit closer to the um, time there we can get to questions. Um, at this stage, um, Keep in mind, this is a staged approach. So not everything's starting straight away. And we are committed to making sure that we provide education and support to the rental sector once we're aware of more information and we're going to be sharing that with our key stakeholders and also to our customers. So just have a quick look at what's new. So just in relation to taking of um, photos, either for a rental property that's been sold or just during a tenancy for like a routine inspection, the RTA has recently released two new fact sheets for property managers owners and also for tenants. These fact sheets have been produced in consultation with representatives from all parts of the rental sector. Um, as part of our outreach team, we regularly meet with our stakeholder working group. So these fact sheets are now available on our website. And more importantly too, if you happen to have a salesperson who may not understand the requirements for tenancy laws in relation to having the tenant's permission to take photos um, that's required, if they're being required for advertising, they need to have the tenant's written consent. And also to remember open houses need to also have the tenant's written consent for that. Just quickly, you may also be aware of the RTA's um, web services for bond-related transactions um, we released in December last year, the ability for managing agents to launch bulk bond lodgements through our RTA web services and not just a single lodgement. So you can lodge up to uh, 50 bonds in one transaction and up to a payment value of $50,000. Um, the process can be used to do top-up bonds or lodging new bonds. Um, we have frequently asked questions, a video demonstration and quick guides to help you with that particular process. So just a reminder that this is also available. And finally, just for the uh, real estate agents or property managers that's in our audience today, um, we have joined forces with the Office of Fair Trading 
and signed a memorandum of understanding. So we'll be working much more closely with the Office of Fair Trading and it's in relation to investigations that have an impact. So as a licensed agent, a leading agent or a property manager. So they can, Office of Fair Training can only investigate offences that are committed by um, literally those three groups. They're not looking at private landlords or tenants. There are two occasions during the tenancy where an incident can occur that is an offence against our legislation and also Office of Fair Trading legislation. So one is when a rent of bond is not paid to the RTA within the 10 day timeframe, and also to when a rent payment is used for any other purpose. So we're talking about like a water bill or using it towards cleaning. So for licensed agents, please be aware for the difference in the penalty units. So Office of Fair Training have significantly more penalty units than the RTRA Act. So as an example, non-lodgement of bond under the RTRA is a maximum of 40 penalty units, whereas under the Property Occupation Act, which is your wrong conversion and false accounts, meaning that they've received money belonging to someone else or falsely accounting for the money, it's a thousand penalty units or five years imprisonment. So it's just um, a bit of a flag there just to remind people that if we do get a complaint that um, it falls into these two categories, it may be redirected to the Office of Fair Trading. So we've gone through a lot of information today, but we know that over the coming months, there's going to be a lot more information that we need to disperse to the rental sector. So make sure that you have signed up for our e-news so that we can keep you informed of any of the changes and also any key topics. And remember, you can also connect with us and follow us on LinkedIn as well. We do have our previous very educational resources, including our webinars on tenancy legislation and also key topics, as well as our Talking Tenancy podcast series, which a lot of that is actually aimed for tenants. So you can access both of these through the RTAN's website or via podcasts through your preferred app. Okay, so I'm just going to go back through to the questions. So just bear with me while I just need to um, expand my um, screens here. Um, in relation to, there's a question here um, about periodic tenancy, does 60 days no still apply? Can I just be very clear? We don't have a 60 day in our time frame for legislation. We actually have two months notice. Um, and in relation to a periodic tenancy, the only way to end a periodic tenancy will be on the grounds that I have gone through. So the without grounds provision is no longer um, so the two months notice without grounds is, will no longer come into play once the, we have a proclamation date. So just want to be very clear on that. So to end a fixed term agreement, ending on a fixed date, that's fine. In relation to the sale, the owner moving in, um, change of use, demolition and those sort of things, there's all new reasons that's been added in relation to how to end a periodic tenancy. Um, in relation to does the owner need to provide a reason? Um, I'm just not quite sure on that one. Sorry, Lisa, in relation to ending a tenancy, it's very clear about how a tenancy can end. If it's in relation to ending because it's the end of a fixed term, no, there's no reason in relation to that being listed in the legislation at all. Um, Stephanie has also raised about the concern in relation to some owners are moving from holiday to permanent residential. Um, does that mean they cannot do this anymore? Uh, it doesn't mean that they can't do it. And what we are seeing um, over the shortage of accommodation uh, and changes with COVID, we are seeing some people change from holiday accommodation into the permanent sector. Anyone that is actually doing that, all we ask is that you need to then comply with the, the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act and the requirements under our legislation in relation to the paperwork that's required at the start of the tenancy. If you're taking a bond, it needs to be lodged. All the normal requirements of our legislation if you are changing from holiday to permanent rentals. Um, okay, so we just have, um, Lauren, thanks very much for putting in the link too for some of our past webinars. Um, that's great for everyone to see that. Um, what do you need to complete repairs if they don't want to be there? Uh, you need to complete repairs and they don't want to be there. Um, so I'm just going to assume on that one, Karen, in relation to that, if there are repairs to be done um, in relation to whether it's significant repairs, and I think that's the difference. 
can someone still live in the property or is it such significant repairs that they do actually have to leave um, the property, whether the same tenant's coming back or whether um, you're looking at um, replacing it with a different tenant. Um, okay, we've just got screens on that. I am conscious of time because we are coming through to the end of our time here. Um, will the new laws for ending attendance be retrospective? Um, no. Once we know the um, proclamation date, um, the my understanding is that will be the date that the new reasons and I think will be um, commencing from. So at this point in time, it's business as usual in relation to ending a tenancy. So currently, periodic tenancies, two months notice without grounds is still fine. Um, as I said, once we know more about a proclamation date, um, with um, once we know when that actually commences, then the new rules and the new reasons to end a tenancy will come into play. Um, okay, so if a tenant advises you they use an overpayment in rent for a bond clean, can that occur? I'm going to go back on that one, Belle. Thank you very much for your question. At the end of the day, what we're looking at is the use of the rent and the purpose of why that money was paid. So the legislation is very clear. You can't use rent for any other purposes. So it'll be a case of potentially looking at doing a refund and obviously having the payment then to cover cleaning or any other costs. But anything that you do in your business, and I can't give you legal advice, you would want to be making sure that you actually have evidence and documentation to prove what um, you're actually doing in relation to your trust accounts. Um, in relation to, does the same apply for community housing providers being referred to the Office of Fair Trading? So in relation to that, what we're looking at is if you are a licensed real estate agent. So the rules in relation to the Property Occupation Act and the Agents Financial Administration Act. If you are covered under those two legislation, then the reference to going to Office Fair Trading for the penalty provisions will apply. Um, I'm not sure whether some of the community housing providers will actually fall into that category, possibly not, because particularly if you actually are owning your own properties. Um, so that's where that one comes into play. So. Look, I'll just leave it there. We actually have a lot of questions that did come through, a lot of it very similar sort of themes. So thank you for that. A copy of our um, webinar will be available next week. Um, if you do need to revisit some of the reasons to ending a tenancy, some of the processes too for the domestic and family violence um, provisions as well. Oops, sorry, I forgot to even turn the screen on when I did that. So our website does have a lot of information available, um, forms, education resources, so rta.qld.gov.au. Um, and as a final reminder, please make sure that you are always using the latest RTA forms. Um, please make sure that you're not using something that might have been outdated a year or two ago. Make sure that you are using the current forms. Um, if you do need any further assistance, please contact our friendly contact centre staff they're available Monday to Friday, 8.30am um, to 5pm on 1300 366 So there's going to be a survey come up at the end when the webinar does close. This is your opportunity to provide feedback and more importantly, what topics you would like to know more about. So if there's something more in relation to the tenancy legislation or the amendments, please let us know in that survey so that we can look at addressing that for you next time or in future resources or education on our website. So again, thanks everybody for joining me today and we look forward to seeing you next time.